go so far back. <laughs> um, so Alan really is an expert in physiology, intercornea imaging, and I've learned a lot from him. And I've learned a lot from going to his course, uh, Optimizing PCI in New York, which maybe before you start, you can tell us a little bit about your course, um, Alan. Just sort of some housekeeping notes, uh, as always. Um, we're going to have questions through the chat. Uh, we'll stop halfway and there'll be some questions we'll do then. Uh, the questions will be moderated by Joanna, who's one of our general fellows about to start her interventional fellowship. And there'll be questions at the end too. Um, you'll find the session on YouTube. And today is for the first time we're actually streaming it live onto YouTube. For There've been a number of colleagues who've had challenges with Zoom. So they'll be able to watch this on YouTube and those on YouTube, thanks for joining us. So Alan, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Azim. And I uh, just want to congratulate you and the team for putting together this fantastic series. I actually have been following um, most of the talks and the speakers are truly world class and I really have been enjoying it. And it's, it's challenging, it's good, the bar is high. So I'm, I'm, I hope I do a good job today. Okay. So what uh, we're focusing of course on today is physiology. And I tried to kind of um, put together the most important chapters the way I see it, starting from the very basics, which everybody is familiar with, to the more um, esoteric and more complex and more interesting, maybe. These are my disclosures. So let's start with chapter one, the use of physiology for intermediate lesions, which is really the classic um, um, role of physiology and, and what the guidelines describe. And of course, this concept of functional PCI started with the FAME trial, or the FAME made it popular, I should say, which was a randomized trial of about a thousand patients to either angiographically guided PCI or FFR guided PCI in patients with multivessel disease. And what we learned is that FFR was able to downgrade a lot of these patients with multivessel disease, such that the average number of stents per patient was about one stent less in the FFR group, and yet the outcomes were actually better, death or MI, or even MI alone. Um, this is at two years, was significantly reduced with a physiologically guided strategy. We know from FAME2, which was almost the opposite, if you will, FAME2 looked at patients who had significant ischemia, FFR was less than 0.8 in all of those patients, and they were randomized to either medical therapy alone or medical therapy with PCI, looking at patients, what happens to those patients that do not get revascularized in the setting of a significant um, FFR. And this is basically what happened. Um, patients in the medical therapy arm had a about tripling of the event rate um, when compared with those patients undergoing PCI. And those having PCI had similar outcomes to those in the registry, which had a negative FFR at baseline, indicating that FFR in fact is able to distinguish between significant lesions and not. And it makes a difference whether or not we, we revascularize um, those patients. We also have data on the safety of deferring PCI based on FFR, and this is a five-year follow-up in more than 500 patients with intermediate proximal LAD disease, obviously the widowmaker, the disease we're most concerned about. And it turns out if FFR is negative in those patients, the outcome is actually very, very good, very similar to a control group without significant CAD. And so FFR, I think, is one of the few therapies we have in intervention cardiology that actually improves patient outcomes and at the same time actually saves resources, save cost. This is one of my favorite studies. It's actually a survey among 500 interventional cardiologists in, in Europe. And um, they were presented with this type of survey. They had to review five angiograms and then make a decision what they wanna do with those patients. And the decision was whether they wanna go ahead and treat or not treat, or if they want more studies, i.e. FFR or intravascular ultrasound. And so this is how the, the study looked like. This is case one, for example, the patient had three vessel disease. QCA was done on all of these lesions, and the first lesion was about 30%, the second 40%, and this is maybe 60%. So the red circle is the QCA result. And the first striking finding, I think, which is pretty amazing to me, if we ask 500 interventional cardiologists a very simple question, how tight is this lesion, right? The question we ask every day. It turns out that almost for every lesion, the range is between 30 and 90%. 
So how is it possible that 500 of us look at the same picture and somebody thinks it's a 30% stenosis and somebody else thinks it's a 90% stenosis? As again, that's the first finding that I think is very interesting in the study. The second finding is, this is the bar at the bottom, how many times did they ask for FFR? So in the first lesion, which was 30% by QCA, half the participants said, this is enough for me to make a decision based on the angio. 40% wanted FFR and about 10% wanted imaging. And you can see for each lesion um, what, the, what the rates were. When we look at the aggregate findings, this is what we found. In 70% of the cases, everybody was happy to make a decision based on the angiogram. 21% they asked for FFR, 7% for imaging. Among the 71% of cases that, again, they were happy to make the decision based on the angio alone, all of those actually had FFR, unbeknownst to the, to the participants of the study. And it turns out that about half were positive, half were negative. So if we make a decision in an intermediate lesion based on the angio alone, we have about a 50-50 chance of getting it right. And this was confirmed in the large study in, in France, including more than a thousand patients, where they did something called a priori, which was basically categorizing patients based on the angiogram. Again, something we do every day in the cath lab. About 55% of those patients were recommended to have medical therapy, 38% PCI and 7% cabbage. FFR was performed in all of these lesions and then patients were recategorized. And when you're looking at the final numbers, they were very, very similar, right? But the problem is this, among individual patients, 43%, almost half of the patients were actually reclassified based on the angiogram. And when we look at this right graph here, maybe most striking um, in the cabbage arm, 49% of patients remained in the cabbage arm that were recommended to have cabbage based on the angiogram alone. 13% were moved to PCI, but 38%, more than a third, actually went from having a cabbage to medical therapy because none of the lesions were actually significant when evaluated by hemodynamic um, um, FFR. And so the question, this is the fundamental question, I think, of FFR. Why is it that we have such a discrepancy between the angiogram and the, the physiologic findings. And so this I think is a good study and a good example of why this happens. This is an intermediate stenosis in the proximal LAD, FFR is 0.58, critically impaired. But look at the amount of myocardium that invo is involved with this proximal LAD lesion, it's probably 50% of the heart versus what appears to be a pretty significant angiographic stenosis, 80, 90% angiographic stenosis in this RCA, FFR is 0.91, but look at the amount of myocardium, much, much less. And so I think the lesson of this first section, if you will, is that the impact of the myocardial supply area on the FFR is just as important as the diameter stenosis based on the angiogram. So both are um, contributing about equally, in fact, um, to the uh, FFR. And I think FFR nicely integrates both diameter stenosis as well as myocardial supply area, which is why it is superior to just looking at the angiographic image. All right, let's move to chapter two. What do the guidelines say and the appropriate use criteria? Should we use FFR? Of course, this is no mystery. This is the, the most recent European guidelines from 2018. And FFR has the highest class of recommendation 1A in the European guidelines with the highest level of evidence to do FFR in patients um, with a intermediate grade stenosis. And the, the US guidelines are about 10 years old. They give it a, a two-way recommendation. And this is what the European guideline um, um, algorithm is, if you will. Um, if there is documented ischemia with multivessel disease, you know, somebody they should have PCI. If it's if it's non-conformant um, um, to the to the testing, uh, FFR would help. And if there's no documented ischemia, there's an algorithm for that as well. And you know, we have developed our own algorithm, but basically it's, it's very, very similar. It's dividing patients with stable and unstable angina um, and depending on whether or not testing is available and how severe the lesion is, we have also recommendations based on, on who should have FFR and who shouldn't. And which is also very, very similar to the appropriate use criteria, most recently published uh, three years ago, which again, um, stressed the fact that if there's no stress test, 
and there is an intermediate lesion, FFR should be done um, in a number of, um, of scenarios, which includes basically prox LED as well as all the other vessels. So the question is, what is an appropriate number of FFR? I get this question all the time. And so I tried to kind of come up with a little bit of an algorithm here. Um, again, just um, depending on the presentation, ACS versus stable CAD. So if we assume that the split between the two is about 50-50, um, among the 50% of patients who come in with ACS and there's a clear culprit lesion, I think imaging, frankly, is much, much more helpful and we should um, treat those patients with PCI. The non-culprit lesions, especially if it's an intermediate lesion, should probably have physiology, which is roughly 17% of the overall population. Among patients coming in with stable CAD, the question is, do they have some non-invasive testing or not? If there is non-invasive testing, which is about half the patients, and it's concordant, which I assume is about two-thirds, they should have PCI based on those. If the non-invasive testing is discordant, or if there is no, no non-invasive testing and the lesion is intermediate, physiology should be done, which probably is another 28%. So the truth is that maybe we need around 45, 40, 45% of physiology, I think, overall, is appropriate. And I don't think we're quite there, although in the US we have made pretty good headway um, with using physiology now more than 20% of the time. And frankly, I credit the appropriate use criteria um, for, for pushing us uh, that direction. All right, so let's move on to the next topic, which is actually one of my favorite topics, um, which is this. When we do physiology, for whatever reason, we treat that test different from any other test we have in medicine, right? What we do is we say, well, I don't really care about the patient's symptoms. I don't care about any other study that has been done. Physiology is the ring that rules it all. And so the question is, why, um, why is that, right? When we do physiology, my feeling is you sh we should be thinking more and not less. Or this is a lesson of how to avoid being a schmuck. If you don't know what the schmuck is, get a Yiddish dictionary. So this is a case example of a 75-year-old male um, with CAD prior PCI to the RCA who developed pretty classical angina, class 3 uh, CCS angina over three months with an abnormal stress echo in the lateral wall, ST depressions on the EKG, who had an angiogram in an outside hospital. And this is what the angiogram showed. The RCA, the Pensworth, Stensworth uh, patent, and there is mild diffuse disease. On the left side, he has a um, moderate, I would say, um, large uh, uh, OM and a pretty long OM stenosis, mm -hmm. as well as a pretty focal, what appears to be more severe, um, mid-LAD stenosis of a large, large LAD um, territory. And here is another view of that LAD. It's a pretty focal lesion right at the bifurcation with the diagonal branch. So FFR was done um, in both of these lesions. In the LAD, it was 0.83. In the OM, it was 0.88. And given the negative FFR, basically all the testing and all the patient symptoms were ignored. And um, the comment was made that given the negative FFR values, um, his symptoms were unlikely to be cardiac and he was treated with medications. Problem is, of course, he had continued angina and eventually presented to another hospital again within two weeks of the original cardiac catheterization and then was referred to us. So this is what we found. The lesion looks about the same, um, didn't change. And in fact, it was significant um, by physiology. IFR was 0 0.87. And so eventually um, we treated that lesion which was pretty straightforward and the patient did well. So the question is, why do we have this discrepancy? And one part I think is just a pure technical, technical considerations, right? There is a lot of issues um, with doing a proper physiology study. Um, it sounds simple. It is actually one of the most simple things we can do in intervention cardiology, and yet we get it wrong quite a bit of time. This is actually a study we did in the core lab. Um, and, and remember, this is a core lab study. So this is all sites that are familiar with FFR. In fact, many sites were FFR experts. Um, this is the contrast study in which we included 616 patients. And it turns out that of those 616 patients, about 17% had significant drift 
and another 10% had either significant guide dampening or aortic waveform distortion, and in the core lab were classified as having an inadequate study. So when you add this up, this is about 28% of the population having an inadequate um, FFR study done in, in, the, in the clinical trial. So in practice, this could be actually a lot more. And so I think that's part of the reason why we see these discrepancies. Another part is just the basic fact um, that any test that has a threshold, um, of course, um, is, is, um, there is a variability in the test itself, right? So this is looking at FFR, um, two separate FFR measurements within five minutes. And the lesson here is this, the closer we are to the cutoff point, 0 0.8, um, the higher the likelihood that if the test is repeated, you fall onto the other side. So there's almost a 50% probability um, to actually fall on one side or the other if the test is repeated, which makes perfect sense, right? If somebody has FFR of 0 0.79, let's say the first time around, you wait five minutes, it could be 0 0.81 very, very easily. And in fact, when we're looking at the zone between 0.77 and 0.83, there is about a 23% chance of switching um, categories, if you will, from one from ischemia to non-ischemia, if you will, which is not the right expression, but the categories are changed if the test is repeated. And so I think it's much more important to think about this continuum of ischemia or, or risk of, of the continuum of ischemia rather than a single cutoff point. And of course, what we know is that um, the, the flow adapts, if you will, the more significant the, the stenosis is, the microcirculation dilates um, when there is a significant coronary lesion to kind of compensate for that. And when the, when the maximal vasodilation, um, if you will, is achieved within the microcirculation at that point, obviously the physiologic number is gonna get very, very small because the reserve, reserve is completely exhausted. And when that happens, we actually, I think, have a chance of improving prognosis with PCI. So when FFR is in the range between 0.5 and, and 0.65 or so, the ischemia is so severe that we actually have a potential to decrease hard endpoints like, like MI um, by revascularizing the patients. Um, when it's less severe, we might improve symptoms, maybe not so much prognosis, but nevertheless, the importance is that there is a continuum of ischemia, which also means that there is a continued risk. So when we look at this um, FAME2 trial, which we talked about before, and we'll look at the medically treated arm. So these are all patients treated medically. Of course, the patients that had the lowest FFR have the highest risk, about 40 to 50% risk of um, having a, a cardiac event um, within two years um, from, from the enrollment in the study. And it does taper off for sure. But when we're looking at this cutoff point at 0.8, there is still a lot of room here, right? So there is still events happening, of course, between 0.8 and 0.9. So having a quote unquote negative FFR doesn't mean you're not gonna have events. And in fact, when we examining the data um, from this uh, Korean study, ISIS FFR, which was a large um, registry of almost 3000 patients, what we see is that there is an increased risk um, as the FFR decreases. They used 0.9 as the reference when the FFR is between 0.86 and 0.9, there's a 30% increase in, if, of events. But when the FFR is between 0.81 and 0.85, again, above the ischemic threshold, there is a 340% increase um, risk compared to an FFR of, of more than 0.9. And of course, as the FFR declines, the greater the risk. So that kind of makes sense, I think. And, and I think that puts into perspective how we should interpret the results. And so in my view, None of the results are absolute. You shouldn't ignore, obviously, the patient's symptoms. You shouldn't ignore all the other data that is available. You should integrate all the data. This is why we are doctors. We should be thinking more and not less when we do physiology. All right, let's cover one more chapter, and then maybe um, we'll take some, um, some questions. This is also a very commonly asked question. What is... Um, the, the new indices, the resting indices called NHPR, non-hyperemic pressure ratios. There is now available um, an index from basically every company. How do they compare to FFR? And what happens when we do both and they're discrepant? Which one is correct? So let me give you a little bit of background first. Um, IFR was the first um, um, 
of these indices introduced and compared head to head with FFR in two large trials, the Define Flare trial, which included 2,500 patients, half of which got FFR guided PCI, half of which got IFR guided PCI, and then the patients were followed out to, to um, one year. Now the two year data actually is available also. And there was a parallel study called Sweetheart, which basically had the same randomization scheme um, and included about 2,000 patients. So in conjunction, the, the data now we have 4,500 patients randomized to an FFR guided strategy versus uh, an IFR guided strategy. And this is the one year outcomes. And basically what you see is that when we're looking at hard endpoints, this is major adverse cardiac events, there was really no significant difference between IFR and FFR. And when we look at the individual endpoints, and these are patients that were deferred at 12 months, right? We, interestingly enough, as a psychology from an interventional cardiology standpoint, we don't care so much about patients having stents. What we care about is what happens to those patients that we leave alone, that we don't stent. Um, so this is what happens to those patients uh, at 12 months that were deferred. Um, MACE was the same between IFR and FFR, and really all individual endpoints were very, very similar and non-significant statistically. So I think a lot of us now use um, any of these resting indices um, kind of um, the same way as we use FFR, and there are subsequent studies comparing all the resting indices, and the bottom line is they're all the same. Now, let's look at um, another case example. This is a 46-year-old um, female with um, chest pain who was referred to me for microvascular um, assessment. And basically, she has normal coronaries, right? So why am I showing you a case of normal coronaries? Well, it's kind of interesting. When we um, um, actually place a wire in the, in the LED and we measure coronary flow reserve, we first always do a resting gradient. And there is no significant resting gradient, as one would expect, because there's also no significant coronary lesion. What happens with this? lady, however, is as we induce hyperemia, this is with IV adenosine, um, FFR now falls to 0.86. So it's not below the ischemic threshold, that's true, but if there's no coronary lesion whatsoever, shouldn't FFR be one? Why is it 0.86, right? And now we're looking at the coronary flow reserve, which basically tells us how much flow is going through that vessel. Two is considered normal. In her case, it's 2.9. So she has actually a healthy amount of coronary flow, if you will. And so the lesson of this case is the following, which I think is a very, very important lesson and one of the principal concepts, of, if you will, of coronary physiology. We can generate a a uh, pressure gradient two ways, right? So we can have a significant flow limiting stenosis. And if we have that, we can increase flow just a little bit. And by increasing flow a little bit, we're gonna generate the gradient and have an abnormal FFR. But we also can generate an abnormal FFR by having either no lesion, like in this uh, woman, or having a mild stenosis, which is non-flow limiting, but having a lot of flow. And by creating a lot of flow through the vessel, there is so much friction um, that there is actually pressure loss, if you will, by driving the flow through the lesion. And so we can generate a significant gradient by just increasing the flow. And this is one of the case example that we actually published of an intermediate stenosis in the mid-RCA. Um, that had an um, uh, IFR above the ischemic threshold. IFR has a uh, um, threshold of 0 0.89. FFR was below 0.8. Um, so there is a discrepancy, obviously, between the two numbers. But look at the flow reserve. In this case, it's 5.5. Very, very healthy amount of myocardial blood flow. And the reason that FFR is so low is because we drive all that flow through an intermediate stenosis and have basically friction and pressure loss. And we're not sure, to be honest with you, there is no study looking at patients who then subsequently still undergo PCI based on the FFR. But in my view, I don't think that there is much that we can improve if one already has a flow reserve um, of 5.5. And in fact, when we're looking at the aggregate data set um, of this particular study, and I want to walk you through this um, in more detail because it's a little bit complicated. So in this study, IFR was done, FFR was done, and coronary flow reserve was done. And so looking at the left side of this, these are patients with abnormal FFR and abnormal IFR. And as one would expect, the flow reserve also was abnormal at about 
On the other hand, patients who have a normal FFR and normal IFR have a normal flow reserve at about two and a half, very similar to those who have unobstructed CAD. The mismatch box, if you will, is in the middle. These are patients that have an abnormal FFR and a normal IFR. And when we're looking at their flow reserve, it is about 2.5, very similar to those with negative studies or even unobstructive CAD, again, indicating that FFR might overcall um, some of these lesions because of increase in flow. And I think this is an interesting concept to think about. Um, there's also the cheap man's way of measuring CFR is doing a, pressure, a resting index and an FFR. And in fact, when we see a discrepancy, we basically know that flow has to be relatively high because that's the only way to have a normal resting index and an abnormal FFR. So maybe I should stop at this point, um, Azim, and, and take some questions. I know that there is sometimes confusion about these concepts. So maybe we can sp spend a few minutes um, talking about that. Yeah, absolutely. That's great so far and very practical. Uh, I'll let Joanna address. There have been quite a few questions from the, the chat, and I'll have Joanna do, do those. Joanna? Uh, yes. Uh, hi. So um, I actually, that was something that uh, somebody's asking in the chat, and it was my question as well, that uh, we know from the complete trial that um, included mostly, um, you know, a stay elevation of my patients, and there was a positive trial result uh, that... Um, we have a lot, a big population of patients that have non-culprit lesions. And uh, what would be your recommendation about investigating non-culprit lesion physiology in, you know, during an acute coronary syndrome? Yeah, I think that it helps, right? I mean, obviously the focus is on the acute lesion that should be treated first, but many times, frankly, the acute lesion is pretty straightforward and you know, fixing that doesn't take a lot of time. And I think it makes sense to evaluate the, the other lesions with physiology, especially with the resting indices. It's also very, very quick and relatively easy to do. Um, and we can do that um, during the, the setting of, of ACS. Um, there is a number of studies looking at culprit vessel assessment, which I think is, um, is a doable from a practical standpoint and also valid when FFR or, or the resting indices are repeated um, a month later. You know. The, the change is relatively minor. So I think it gives us a good assessment of those non-culprit uh, lesions. And then one can decide if they want to fix it at the same time or bring the patient back, but at least we're not bringing the patient back to do physiology and then it's negative and we kind of wasted you know, a visit to the cath lab. Uh, thank you. Um, and there's another question that is asking, uh, would you recommend assessing CFR and IMR when in doubt about the FFR, IFR result? Yeah, I you know, if, if you have the capability of, of doing so, I think it, it adds another dimension of your physiologic assessment, right? Um, as I said, you can gauge indirectly what the CFR is if you do a resting index and you do FFR. But, um, you know, if you have capability of measuring CFR, I think it would help because if CFR is high, you know, then you have to think about you know, does it really help to revascularize the vessel? How symptomatic is the patient? What other data do I have available? So then you have to also integrate, you know, all the other data points you have. Um, another question is, when you repeat uh, FFR in borderline values, do you use the same dose of hyperemic agent or increase the dose? No, I don't think there is good data that increasing the dose beyond the recommended doses actually makes makes a difference. I like to keep things standardized so we can actually compare things. And sometimes, you know, you create databases for research and other purposes, and then it makes things very complicated when you have, you know, different doses. So I would say the, the standard recommendation is if you're using IV adenosine, it's 140 mics per kg uh, per minute. If you're using intracoronary, which which I use most of the time, unless I use, I use CFR, um, I use 100 mics um, bolus in the in the right and 200 mics bolus in, in the left system, which has been shown um, at least in one study uh, to kind of create basically maximal hyperemia um, with relatively minor side effect profile. Okay. Um, another question is, uh, can we use physiology to drive revascularization in intermediate stenosis of collateral donor vessels in patients with CTO? Uh, as an example, an RCA with a 70% stenosis giving collaterals to a CTO of the LAD. Uh, 
Yeah, so that, that's a, uh, a sophistic, more sophisticated question. So that's, that's good. It goes back to the slide um, you know, I showed in the beginning, which is that FFR or physiology in general integrates lesion severity as well as myocardial supply area, right? And so the question here is, if there is a CTO in a different territory, but an intermediate lesion um, supplies both, let's say, the LAD as well as the inferior wall, there is more myocardial supply. And so in theory, FFR would be lower, which, which is true, it is. But in practical terms, the difference is relatively minor. It is never, ever more than five points. So, you know, I think, you know, if you're in the borderline zone, it might make a difference. But otherwise, I don't think it really um, influences much, to be honest with you, because the change is relatively minor, only within a few um, within a few points. So, theoretically, yes, from a practical standpoint, I don't think it matters that much. Thank you. Um, another question uh, from the audience is: uh, What are your thoughts on doing downstream FFR after standing a proximal lesion? in a vessel with long segment disease to decide um, if the distal stand is required. I, I like that strategy a lot. And we're gonna talk about post-PCI um, FFR actually in a minute. But um, yes, in, in theory, you know, one of the puzzling things in interventional cardiology is that a lot of people do use physiology before. So they pay for the wire, the wire's on the table, then it's abnormal, they fix a lesion, um, but then they don't bother to recheck it, which is kind of interesting because, you know, why wouldn't you recheck, especially if the wire already is available and there's pretty good data that we leave a lot of lesions behind and still have residual ischemia, even when we think we have a good result um, based on the angiogram. Mm -hmm. uh, great. Another question is, um, is it important in diabetic population, uh, the CFR assessment due to the probability of having a positive negative FFR and negative IFR due to microvascular dysfunction. Yeah, so you know it's it's a it's a difficult question or it's a difficult problem that we have that there is obviously a lot of interaction between the coronary physiology itself and and the health of the myocardium, if you will, the you know microcirculatory function. So in patients who have diabetes or other risk factors that have microvascular disease. Um, obviously, the level of hyperemia will be somewhat impaired because the microcirculation can't respond properly. Um, and in those cases, obviously, FFR, you know, might be um, underestimating the lesion. On the other hand, you can also say that, well, you can fix the vessel, but you still leave the microvascular problem behind. So, you know, you might not be improving necessarily symptoms. So it's actually a different balance, I would say, between the microcirculation and the coronary lesions, and it's not a, not a simple thing. The resting indices make it a little bit easier because there's less interference, I think, from the microcirculation, and they more isolate the coronary lesions, if you will, um, allowing you to maybe make a better assessment um, of those lesions in the setting of microvascular dysfunction. Alan, um, so I know you use F IFR uh, as your resting indice, and you know there are two now large randomized clinical studies in New England Journal of Medicine with clinical data for IFR. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, I mean, a, a question I get asked often, are all the resting indices equal? I mean, considering that for all the others other than IFR, we don't actually have clinical data. So using just the bench top data or the validation data they've used showing that there's good uh, correlation with FFR, is that sufficient? Or do we need clinical data on all of them? You know, it's a, it's a question that we have debated actually for a long time when the other resting indices came out. And um, just just for everybody's knowledge, so there have been um, all the resting indices compared themselves to IFR. A lot of them have been done, you know, kind of in modeling data, um, although a lot of it is patient data as well. And the correlation is literally 0 0.99, as close as it gets in biology. And so the question then became, well, we have pretty good data indicating that these new resting indices are basically equivalent to IFR. Um, do we need clinical trials in all of them? And you know, my opinion is that it would be a waste. I, I, I think that they're all very, very close, if not the same. And frankly, you kind of saw my philosophy on how to use physiology. I don't like to use it as a yes, no. I like to use it as one additional data point. You know, if you're close to the cutoff point, I think you need to kind of figure out, you know, other things anyway. I think physiology helps you the most if it's clearly abnormal or clearly normal. And so when you're looking at it that way, it 
it is kind of irrelevant if you know there is a minor variation between one resting index versus another so i think it would be a waste of resources frankly to do large randomized trials with the new indices versus ffr or even ifr because the results are going to be very very similar to what we already have and i think we can really invest our resources into better and more intelligent trials um that, that, than that so i think that that can be used equivalently so if you have only one wire in your cath lab, which I think is, is the case in the majority of cath labs, I don't think it matters, um, you know, which resting index you use. Azim, maybe we should move on and, and, and do some questions at the end. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds good. All right. So I think this is one of my favorite topics, actually, is um, how to use physiology for PCI guidance. So now I want to kind of go away from assessing is there ischemia or no ischemia to identifying how should we treat a specific vessel? And I think this is a great example, right? It's not surprising that in this case, there is significant ischemia um, in the anterior wall um, in this um, LAD, which has you know, diffuse disease as well as maybe three distinct lesions um, as indicated here. But what really is more important is how should we treat this, right? Should we just do an FFR or IFR of this vessel? We know there's ischemia and then everything else is, is based on the angiogram, or can we use physiology to identify which of these lesions we should treat? And so the first principle I think we have to understand is how does FFR work in tandem lesions? And this is a very, very complicated scenario. Um, as you can see here, there is a mathematical solution on how to overcome this, which is not really very practical um, at all and not really used um, in, in clinical practice. But the bottom line is this, because there is a proximal stenosis, it influences the distal lesion because you don't have enough flow coming to the distal lesion by the obstruction in the proximal vessel. And it's vice versa, the same is true because there is an obstruction downstream, there is not enough flow going through the proximal stenosis. And so there is a crosstalk or interaction between the lesions making FFR very difficult um, to do in that scenario. And so this is one example. This was actually a life case at one of the courses where FFR was done, it was abnormal 0.74. And as you see, there is tandem lesions here in the OM and the proximal cirque. The wire is pulled back um, to the midsection, if you will, and the midsection is 0.91, indicating that maybe the proximal lesion is not so severe, so we should go ahead and stand um, this OM lesion, which also looks more severe based on the angiogram, frankly. So that was kind of obvious. It was done. FFR was repeated, and now FFR is actually lower, 0.69, than it was before. And so the question that is, that is obvious in this case, how is it that you fix one of the lesions and FFR actually is lower than it was before. And it goes back to what we discussed before, which is this concept of flow. We have now um, alleviated the distal lesion. So now we have a lot more flow going through the vessel. And by having this increased amount of flow, um, we unmask the proximal stenosis. And obviously now we have a low FFR. So now the proximal was treated. And by treating the proximal stenosis, um, eventually physiology was restored in this vessel. But the problem is it was complicated. It was for um, pullbacks, um, IV adenosine, um, discomfort, time, all of that, that you know, potentially could be avoided. And so this is a schema of, of how a resting index compares to a hyperemic index when we have tandem lesions or diffuse disease. So when we're looking at, again, hyperemic flow, um, in the setting of, of two lesions, what happens is when we measure distal to both lesions, flow obviously is impaired. When we fix um, one of these lesions, um, flow is restored um, because we alleviated the stenosis, if you will. And now by having more flow going to the proximal stenosis, um, it's Alan, we lost you. Um, could, if you. If you could maybe just do the slide again. Sorry, we lost you there. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. So as, as I said, what, what happens is as we alleviate the, the distal stenosis, 
we have now more flow going through the vessel. And by having more flow, we basically change out of the number for the proximal lesion. Now, the reason why this is important is because when we have multiple serial lesions, when we do an FFR pullback, it's very difficult to know which of these lesions should we treat when the number actually changes once we treat one of the lesions. And so this is why many of us advocate to do a resting index pullback, which is basically the concept is described here. The resting flow remains largely unchanged up until maybe a 90 plus percent stenosis. And so we can use that to our advantage if there's two 70% serial lesions, for example, the flow remains pretty much normal. So as we pull back, we actually can identify those lesions and we can kind of um, judge them separately from each other, if you will, and understand which of the lesions is more significant and which needs to be treated. And we actually can predict what the post-PCI outcome might be. So in the case I showed you um, before, I think this is actually a pretty interesting and surprising result. The lesion that looks most significant based on the angiogram, lesion number three, actually only has four IFR points of pressure loss. Lesion number two has a loss of 12 points. And then the most significant stenosis based on physiology is actually the osteal stenosis, which angiographically maybe is the least significant stenosis. And again, the reason is because it supplies a huge amount of myocardium. So based on the angiogram, I would submit to you that many people would have treated lesion number three and lesion number two versus from a physiologic standpoint, I think we can treat lesion number one and two instead and have a much, much better physiologic result. The other important feature of doing this resting index pullback is to identify diffuse disease from focal disease. When we have diffuse disease, obviously it's much, much more difficult to treat. Maybe those patients are better treated medically or even with bypass surgery rather than with a focal stent versus when we have a large focal step up, I know that we can help these patients very well by putting a stent in that location. And it also identifies the location of the PCI very nicely. So completely different patterns. And I think they should be treated differently and this is illustrated in, in these case examples where the IFR was exactly the same, 0 0.86 um, in the distal vessel. But when we do the pullback, what we find is that in this case, there is diffuse disease with two step ups. So two focal lesions and diffuse disease. The next case, there is one large jump. So one focal lesion, very easily treatable with a single stent. Here, there is also diffuse disease, mild diffuse disease, I would say, with a large step up. So again, a focal lesion that can be easily treated. And then sometimes there's only diffuse disease. And again, in those cases, we have to think about what the best strategy might be. But the bottom line is that a distal FFR or even IFR assessment is not enough to identify what the pattern of disease is and what the best PCI strategy might be. And then if you want to make it even more fancy, we can now co-register to the angiogram. Um, and then when we do that, we can also look at the pattern. This is a very focal lesion marked by all of these dots in the osteal um, RCA. So again, a relatively easy, um, uh, straightforward stent versus a more diffuse disease pattern in this LAD. And we actually can even plan the procedure by marking if we place the 38 millimeter stent, how much IFR could we gain back and what is the post-procedure or the predicted post-procedure IFR, which actually has been shown to be relatively accurate. And so we can really plan the procedure much more accurately and um, identify the entire process of what we should be doing ahead of time before we start putting stents. All right, this question was, was asked before, should we use physiology for post-PCI assessment? What is the data and, and what is the potential benefit? So we have just completed a study called the FIND PCI um, of 500 patients. All of those patients had abnormal baseline IFR and then they were treated according to standard of care, which usually is angiographically guided PCI. Intervascular imaging was done in 20% or so um, of the cases, which is kind of the, the average, I guess, in Europe and, and the US. And so the question of the study was after we had a good result, so a successful angiographic result where normally the operator would say, we're done with the procedure and um, we can move on. We did the blinded final IFR and IFR pullback to identify how much disease is left behind 
and what is the pattern, if you will, of the disease that is left behind. And so one interesting finding of the study is how much IFR gain we have in individual lesions post-PCI. So I would submit to you that the patients on the left here, um, going from an IFR of 0 0.2 to 0.9 or even 1, will have a tremendous benefit from PCI. And that's the case, I would say, maybe in half the population, the first 200 patients. But the rest of the patients here, they had actually very little IFR gain. Some actually had IFR loss. Right? And so in those cases, the procedure might be um, less beneficial for the patient. And this is one case where um, there is severe disease in this distal LAD. This is the result post-PCI. And this is the physiology, the IFR 0 0.39 severely impaired pre-PCI. Um, and after treatment, it goes up to 0 0.74, certainly a significant improvement. But what we find when we do the pullback is that the stent is actually fine. There's no gradient at all within the stent, but there's a huge step up, very focal gradient um, in this mid LAD where this, I would say intermediate angiographic lesion is. And frankly, if the operator would have done this um, unblinded or, or on a routine basis, if you will, I would think that most of us would have put another stent and restored physiology back to normal um, if we did this, I guess, on a routine basis. And the overall finding of the study is that 24%, basically one in four patients, after what appears to be an angiographically successful PCI, still had an IFR below the ischemic threshold of 0 0.89 or less. But the good news is that on the pullback, most of those 80% of those lesions were focal, and so in theory could be treated with additional PCI, again, if this um, pullback would have been done. This is one example, actually, of um, an IFR-guided uh, PCI, diffuse disease in the RCA, including the distal bifurcation and also the um, RPL. Um, so obviously, the, these are the basic questions. Is it significant? And if so, where should we treat? And so in this case, um, the IFR is very, very low in the distal um, RPL, 0 0.56. But what we find is we pull the wire back and it basically goes back to normal 0 0.98, just um, isolating this short lesion in the RPL. So all of this diffuse disease in the RCA actually is not significant from a hemodynamic standpoint and in all likelihood can be treated medically with a very, very good result. So the idea was, okay, let's just place a stent where there's severe pressure loss, treat the significant lesion and leave the rest behind. And in theory, if we did that, we could restore physiology almost back to normal 0 0.98. That's your predicted post-PCI IFR. So a stent was placed um, in, the, in the RPL. And then FFR and IFR were repeated. They improved quite substantially above the ischemic threshold by IFR 0 0.92, not the predicted 0 0.98. So imaging was done and demonstrated the stent was underexpanded. It was actually a larger vessel than anticipated, which obviously happens frequently when we add imaging to the angio. So it was post dilated with a larger balloon. And then after post dilatation, the IFR was exactly as predicted 0 0.98, with treating a simple focal lesion as opposed to paving the entire vessel with stent. And so the question, and now coming to the last chapter uh, of, of this talk, what is what I think state-of-the-art PCI um, in 2020? And I think the best example that we currently have is a Syntax 2 trial. The Syntax 2 was a single arm trial, if you will, as a follow-up of the original Syntax study, um, which was a physiologically guided um, uh, PCI strategy in patients with multivessel disease and left main disease, or left main disease, I should say. Um, and it was a combination between IFR and FFR. And then most of these lesions also had imaging guidance in 84% of patients, IWAS was performed, physiology was performed in nearly all the patients. So the procedure was guided based on, um, on imaging and physiology and then compared, if you will, to the original Syntax 1 cohort. And what we find is very similar to the FAME data we discussed before, is that we can downgrade many of these three vessel patients to two vessels, sometimes even single vessel disease. Almost half the patients were downgraded by using physiology, which obviously leads to fewer stents um, implanted, cost saving, but also importantly, 
better outcomes. The outcomes of Syntax 2 now is about 10% versus 17% event rate at one year um, in the original Syntax 1 cohort. Um, and when we overlay now the uh, cabbage arm of Syntax 1, which was an 11% event rate, it's very, very similar to, um, to the Syntax 2 results. So if we use obviously better STEM technology, but also imaging and physiology, we can get to the level of, of bypass in terms of outcomes in this very challenging um, complex patient population. And maybe I can put in a plug for our upcoming conference end of October. We hope to have a uh, course uh, by that time actually in person as well as online. Um, I should mention all fellows um, are complimentary, including housing. So um, please sign up um, um, and it's going to be a much, much more in-depth course on both imaging um, and physiology. So with that, Azim, I'd like to, to close and obviously I'd be happy to answer more questions. Thank you so much. Alan, Alan awesome. awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. It was really great. And uh, I'm looking forward to your course. Uh, I think also the fact that you've made it you know, free for fellows, including housing, is an incredible opportunity uh, for those who are uh, in the New York area. It's so a nice Yana, hotel, too. And a nice hotel, too. Exactly. Uh, Yana, I know there have been quite a few questions from uh, the chat. I'm also going to ask Antonio you know, to make a comment in a moment. Yes, so there's a question. Uh, what is the cutoff uh, in I IFR points drop that you use to identify significant lesion when you have tandem lesions? It, so the, the cutoff points, if you want to use cutoff points in the distal vessel, remain unchanged whether you have tandem lesions or single lesions. So with IFR and all the other resting indices, it's 0 0.89. SFR, of course, is 0 0.8. And how we do this, we measure it in the distal vessel, including all the disease. And, you know, obviously, if it's above the ischemic threshold, then it doesn't really matter what the contribution is of each lesion. If it's abnormal, then, of course, you want to assess each lesion separately to understand which one is contributing the most and which one should be treated. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. Uh, when we have a focal lesion just proximal to a myocardial bridge, how does physiology help you in assessing individual contribution of lesion when you have an ischemia value after maximal hyperemia? So bridging, you know, makes assessment of physiology somewhat challenging because it's a dynamic process, right? That's the whole, whole idea of the bridging that you have basically a systolic gradient. Some people believe that a resting index might be actually more useful in assess bridges in general because most of the flow occurs in diastole and so looking at a diastolic index will help you understand physiology better if you have impairment of diastole from the bridge maybe it has to be treated if diastole indicates that it's that the flow is, is okay then there is enough blood flow to the myocardium that the bridge can be treated um, medically so um, bridging is somewhat complex to assess and having a combination of a, of a fixed stenosis, let's say a proximal stenosis and a bridge certainly makes it even more challenging. But I think the principle is still the same that when we do a resting index pullback, we can identify the contribution um, of the different lesions. Thank you. Um, any thoughts on the Forza study which compared OCT with FFR guided PCI in intermediate lesions and showed less maze with OCT? Yeah, it was certainly a very provocative study, and I think all of us are, would be interested to see, you know, a larger scale study comparing an imaging strategy um, with a with a physiology strategy. As you indicated, that particular study indicated that using OCT in particular led to better outcomes. Um, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of imaging. I think that um, imaging certainly helps. Um, we actually frequently use a combination of physiology and imaging, so I'm I'm not opposed to that. And if at the end of the day a large scale study indicates that imaging is superior, then maybe that's what we should be doing. Yeah, you know, Alan, I'm gonna ask Antonio wanted to make a comment on one of your cases. Um, I am going to, before he makes his comment, just say, you know, this is one of really one of the best talks I've heard on FFR. Also, because I, one of the concepts I like the most that you highlighted is moving away from this sort of using FFR as a traffic light. You know, it's green or it's red. And right. really talking about this gradient of risk that, you know, a patient with an FFR of 0 0.85 is potentially also at a higher risk of having events. 
So I think, you know, really thank you for highlighting that. It's something we've discussed, me and Antonio, a lot on numerous occasions. Antonio, I know you had a, a couple of comments over one of the cases. Um, just unmute yourself. Okay. There you go. Yes. Uh, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I really agree with uh, uh, almost everything you said, uh, especially uh, the syntax too is a really a great uh, a great study, and uh, I wish it would be standard of care uh, in PCI. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, one uh, consideration: uh, the uh, in the initial slides you showed a RCA lesion, which uh, angiographically looks uh, critical, but with the acceptable FFR. Uh, can we make uh, the consideration that? Uh, the continuous, the chronic uh, slow flow that the right coronary artery with the stenosis has uh, kind of uh, underdevelop uh, or keep uh, uh, dormant the distal bed. So we underestimate the physiological potential of the distal bed because it's been undernourished and uh, if uh, we have the virtual possibility to open in the stenosis and measure the distal bed uh, two months or one month later would be different. It's certainly possible. I think, you know, as I mentioned before, the advantage of using physiology is that it integrates the angiographic severity and the myocardial supply area. What I didn't mention before is it doesn't, it also incorporates the viability of the myocardium, if you will. So if there is infarct, for example, you might have a tight stenosis, but FFR could be negative because the myocardium is dead. What is the possibility is what Antonio is saying, of course, that it, it could be viable. So it's hibernating in fact, um, but it's not really having a lot of metabolic demands. And so FFR could be underestimating a critical lesion. And when it's opened, maybe by now supplying, you know, more oxygen, obviously, to the myocardium, it could now you know, start working again, if you will, and, and improve um, its contractility over time. Certainly, that's, that's a potential. I think if you have hibernating myocardium, um, you know, you should be more um, more in favor of revascularization with potential recovery of that myocardium and maybe physiology and frankly, in those, you know, pretty sick patients might not be the right tool um, to, to uh, assess those lesions and make those decisions, which is why I always said, look, if you do use physiology, it's, it's one additional data point you have to many, many other data points you should incorporate into, into your decision making. You know, the other point is to use the resting gradient. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, if you have a, a small uh, bed, uh, distal, the resting gradient is good enough. Uh, if you have a 0 0.9, 0 0.95 in a diagonal, you know that there is no reason to do any physiologic testing. If you have 0.9 in the proximal LED, is a total different story. So. I think uh, uh, we need to utilize the resting gradient also to evaluate the result of PCI. And uh, also we need to use FFR uh, to take away the idea that every dissection needs to be stented. Uh, I know that you don't use much uh, uh, drug-coated balloon for native, uh, as a matter of fact, it's not available in the US, but uh, with the availability of FFR, you can really broaden the usage of drug-coated balloon, especially in diffuse disease. So, uh, and especially utilizing contrast, that it's kind of speedy and uh, really makes uh, all your procedure more physiologically, more, uh, more oriented toward thinking and not just luminology and period. Yeah, I, I think you made also a very important point, which is, I did mention in my talk, but obviously it matters what uh, territory or what lesion you're assessing. If you're looking at a diagonal stenosis versus a prox LED, you have to evaluate them completely separately, right? The 0.9 in one is not the same as a 0.9 in another. And so that's what I meant with integrating other clinical data, because yes, in a, in a prox LAD, you certainly would be more careful. Maybe you're going to add imaging um, and, and potentially trend more towards treating than maybe a side branch or, or a less important um, myocardial territory.
you wanna, um, I think there were a few other questions on the chat, so maybe we can just do those and sure. and then we'll close up. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question uh, asking about the gender differences in uh, physiology studies and um, uh, if you think uh, there should be some consideration of that, especially when there's discordance between IFR and FFR. Well, it, you know, in general, I guess the myocardial mass is a little bit smaller in women than, than in men. And so, you know, part of that could, could play a role that potentially a similar um, degree stenosis with, with less myocardial mass might be less significant with physiology. But honestly, from a practical standpoint, I, I don't think that, um, you know, I would treat one different than the other, right? I mean, you still have your thresholds. You're still looking at this continued um, ischemia risk, if you will, you still integrate all the other data points. So I'm not sure it makes a practical difference, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so one more question about uh, left main and LAD. Um, and so uh, what would you think about assessment uh, of lesions uh, that there, there's a discrepancy between left main and LAD? Um, so there is data indicating that the discrepancy between the resting index and FFR is actually greater in the proximal LAD or an LAD in general. And I think the reason is because you have more flow in these proximal um, large vessels. And as we discussed, flow is influencing FFR maybe more than, than resting indices. And so there is a, a larger potential for discrepancy. And then the question, of course, is, you know, which one do you believe? Which one is correct, right? There was one study looking at um, LADs in particular as a sub-analysis um, from, from defined flare. Um, and that study indicated that IFR actually was superior in terms of one-year outcomes. The event rate with IFR guidance was about 2.5% versus 5% with FFR. So, you know, many believe that, you know, maybe FFR is more accurate in a proximal LAD. The study indicated actually the opposite. So I don't think we still have, you know, enough data to make a final call, if you will, if you want to compare the two. But the bottom line is, I, I don't think we should um, believe necessarily FFR would be superior um, in, in that setting. And there's a few more questions coming. Uh, there's a question about uh, commenting uh, about osteo left main. Uh, one second. Sorry. Uh, osteo left main assessment IVUS versus FFR versus IFR. You know, Left main in general, my preference is to use imaging um, over physiology, frankly, although people obviously advocate physiology as well. You can use physiology. Um, if you do so, you got to do it carefully. So the key there is that you want to normalize um, your, your pressure wire outside the vessel in the aorta, right? Because you have an osteo lesion, be it the RCA or the left main. Um, and then what you want to do is to um, put the wire obviously distal and then disengage the guide completely to be able to see if there's a gradient or not. And if you want to use hyperemia, that's not an occasion to use intracoronary. In that case, you would have to use IV adenosine to be able to induce hyperemia because it's hard to inject um, into the coronary and disengage the guide quickly enough to kind of um, obtain enough hyperemia if you choose to do FFR. So it's, it's more complex to evaluate, but certainly it's doable if you want to use physiology in that setting. Thank you. Um, there's a question uh, about any role of FFR, IFR in bifurcation lesion side branch interpretation after the first stent. You know, I think physiology actually is very, very helpful in, in, in assessing the, the bifurcation. Um, the problem, frankly, is that, as, as we're all aware, the wires aren't the same as our workhorse wires, and sometimes it's a little difficult to manipulate, you know, an FFR wire through the stent into the side branch. But if we do that, um, we actually find that frequently, despite the angiographic appearance, physiology is kind of, um, you know, not even not with the normal limits, but certainly way above the ischemic threshold. And we can potentially avoid um, doing a kissing balloon or injuring the side branch and potentially having better long term outcomes by not injuring side branch when we use physiology assessment. So if we had better wires and we would do this routinely, I think we would be very surprised, um, you know, how many times we, we actually don't find a significant gradient in the side branch despite angiographically being pinched. I'm gonna, I'm gonna maybe have Antonio give one last, give a comment and I have one last comment, uh, if that's okay. And then we'll close out. Yeah, 
my favorite consideration about FFR to give to, to fellows is please do not consider FFR like pregnancy. FFR is a continuous, pregnancy is not a continuous. Okay, thanks, Antonia. Um, so, uh, Ellen, maybe just one last comment from you. You know, I'm really intrigued by the post stenting, um, using physiology for post stenting. To you know, we, we've always thought about using imaging for to look at our stenting uh, and looking at whether we're doing a good uh, good job. But you know, the it it may tell us about the actual stent, but it doesn't tell us about the other lesions and the significance of other lesions. So maybe if you can um, just very briefly tell people about Define GPS and what, you know, the new study that you're going to be the PI of and how that will help address the issues of post uh, stenting optimizing results. Yeah, thanks Azim. So as, as people might be aware, the follow-up study to Define PCI is Define GPS, which is going to be a, a randomized trial now of using um, IFR and IFR pullback to guide the procedure. Um, versus a standard um, angiographic approach, if you will. The study will be in roughly 2,200 to 3,000 patients. It's an adaptive design and hopefully will show us if there is in fact benefit from physiology guided uh, PCI. And Azim is actually on the uh, steering committee among many other um, you know, high ranking people. So I think it's gonna be a very, very interesting study um, once completed and hopefully will kind of um, be the next step of physiology where we're not only using physiology to assess intermediate lesions, but actually use it for PCI guidance. Excellent. Alan, uh, thank you so much. This was really a fantastic talk. And, and for me, one of the best talks in physiology I've ever, I've ever heard. Uh, thank you so much really for having me. Great. Uh, Joanna, thank you so much for moderating um, the questions. Uh, Antonio, thank you for joining and, and all the participants. Uh, just to let you know, tomorrow at 12.30, we do have our uh, Structural Heart Failure Journal Club, which is a very interactive one tomorrow uh, related to COVID-19 myocarditis. And then on Thursday morning at 7.30, we have our next GATH conference, uh, which is on CTOs. So hopefully I'll get to speak to most of you then. Thanks again for joining. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Antonio. Bye, Alan.